Hello, this is Jeff Neville for Selective Imagery. If you'd like to skip ahead and uh, go past my introductory slideshow, it kind of shows uh, you folks what I like to take pictures of, jump ahead to about the 1 minute and 45 second mark, and that should get you close to where we start the real deal here with the video. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Welcome to Selective Imagery. Welcome to the Nikkor 800mm VRSPF hands-on review, including stills and video and a lot more discussion on the other long telephoto lenses in a comparison with the 400 2.8 with the 1.4 tele and the 600 f4 with the 1.4 tele. Benefits, differences, cost comparisons, so on and so forth. Then we'll get into my actual use of the 800 millimeter lens with uh, samples of still images as well as, as video clips. So it's going to be very detailed and it's going to be kind of long, but I hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone, this is Jeff Neville for Selective Imagery. And today we're going to be talking about some Nikon long telephoto lenses. Uh, specifically the Nikkor Z mount 800 millimeter f 6.3 VRS phase Fresnel lens which has a lens cap that looks like this comes in a fancy little backpack like this And right now, it's just above my head on my top shelf of my camera collection, mounted on my Z9. But before I take it off the body and show it closer to the camera and talk about it, let's just talk about these long lenses in general and why you might want to buy an 800 and how it compares to the 400 2.8 with the built-in 1.4 teleconverter and the 600 millimeter f4 that just came out with the built-in 1.4 times teleconverter and uh, just have a general conversation about the specifications what makes one different than the other why is it that the 800 pf is just under sixty five hundred dollars where the 400 2.8 is basically 14 and the 600 f4 is 15 and a half thousand so let's start off with some of the specs and we'll compare the specs between these three lenses so one of the big things about the 800 pf being the fact that it's a pf lens it's significantly lighter and that's due to the just the nature of the design of a phase fresnel lens Okay, it knocks a lot of weight off of, off of any lens that's PF type. It typically reduces the number of lens elements that are in the lens. So all this results in a lens that's small, 
for its focal length and much lighter than a typically designed lens that does not use PF lens elements. So size-wise, the 800 is 5.6 inches in diameter, whereas the 400 is 6.2, and the 600 is 6.5 inches in diameter. In terms of length, the 800 is 15.2 inches long, the 400 is 15 inches long, and the 600 is 17.3 inches long. Now here's where things get a lot different. The 800 weighs 5.25 pounds. The 400 weighs 6.5. And, and the 600 weighs 7.18 7 pounds. So there's, like I said, one of the big features, one of the big things talked about with this lens is that you can hand hold it, take pictures with it handheld. Now, I'm not going to, going to imply for a minute that you're going to have that on a camera, um, a camera strap around your neck with the Z9 with this lens hanging off of it, and you're going to be able to walk through the woods for eight hours and not be sore. I, I think that would be a little bit ludicrous. So I think you you would carry a, a monopod with you um, when you need it. I mean, if you're trying to get a picture of a bird in a tree doing a certain thing, I'm sure there's a limit to how long you can have your arms up pointing up at that tree be before you start to feel it in your arms a little bit, even though it is a very light five and a quarter pounds. Now, it's basically... 50% lighter, about 50% lighter than the F-mount 800 F5.6 when it has the FTZ adapter mounted on it. Now the F-mount lens, um, in test comparisons that other people have done, you know, they'll say that that lens might be just a tad sharper, just by the smallest amount, but it's too heavy to hand hold it. And it also sells for 16000 basically 16300 bucks. So that's a factor as well. Now, your minimum aperture is f6.3. Your maximum is f32. When you get to the 400 millimeter lens, the minimum is f2.8. If you have the teleconverter engaged, it goes to f4. And the, and the uh, maximum aperture goes from f22 to f32 if you have the teleconverter engaged. The 600 millimeter is f4, obviously, and it's a 5.6 when you engage the tele, and it's f32 at uh, without the tele engaged, and it's f45 for a maximum aperture with the tele teleconverter engaged. Now, maximum reproduction ratio, which would be your magnification factor, like if you were going to get into, you know, uh, macro photography. Well, let's not kid ourselves. None of these lenses really uh, are magnifying anything. They're just taking what's out there and bringing it closer. Uh, the reproduction ratio for the 800s 0.16 times, 0.17 to 0.23 for the 400, depending whether the tele is engaged or not, and 0.14 or 0.2 if the tele is engaged on that 600 millimeter. So that's not a spec that I, I really even care that much about. Now, the big difference is how many lens elements there are. You have 22 lens elements in 14 groups. In the 800, you got 25 elements in 19 groups in the 400, and you have 26 elements in 20 groups in the 600. And they all have a variety of lenses, uh, lens elements in them. The 800 has three ED, one SR, one PF. The 400 has two ED, two fluorite elements, one SR element, and one super ED element. And the 600 has three ED, two fluorite, two SR elements, and one super ED element. Now, in terms of um, your VR capabilities, 
they're all the same. They're basically the lens. The lens by itself uh, has five stops. If you mount it on a Z9, you get five and a half stops. Um, they all have nine diaphragm blades, so that's the same. They all use rear slip-in filters, 46 millimeter. They all have advanced weather sealing. They all have um, the ability to program a recall button for uh, a given um, focusing distance so that you can just program one of your function buttons. So you hit that button and it'll go to whatever you stored in that memory recall mode and automatically just focus to where that subject matter is. Um, people use that a lot with sports photography. Okay, they may be um, focusing on um, first I base. I didn't understand that. They may be focusing on first base, um, but they may have the uh, memory recall button set for home plate or set for third base or something like that. Um, you know, big difference is the is the coatings. The 800 has nano crystal coat and a fluorine coat. The 400 has what they call Arneo coat, which is um, works with the nano crystal coat. It's like an additional coating. You have fluorine coating and you have meso meso amorphous coating. And um, basically, the 600 has the nano, uh, the fluorine, and the mesoamorphous coating, but doesn't have the Arneo coating. So they all have different coatings, and of course that's something that has a, makes a difference in the pricing of the lenses. You 800 uses stepper motor technology. Um, there isn't anyone who's reviewed that lens and used it that's complained about autofocus speed, uh, it's very quiet. It's not noisy. Um, it's, um, you know, uh, very good in uh, shooting video. Uh, they all have minimized or eliminated focus breathing for the most part. Uh, so shooting video with any of those lenses is really, really good and not a problem. The... The, you have uh, Silky Swift voice coil motors in the 400 and the 600 millimeter lens, and I'm sure that adds a lot to the cost of the lens. Um, now, I don't know if they did that uh, for... I don't know if they had to, to go to that technology because obviously the lens is way more, you have more lens elements, you have more weight in the lens elements, and I'm just theorizing that maybe the stepper motors would have been struggling a little bit or would have been bigger than they wanted to put in the lenses, um, you know, to handle the weight of, of those groupings of lens elements that are going to be moved, so they came up with, a, with another technology that, uh, that is better and quieter and maybe more reliable for, for lenses that have a lot of, you know, beef to them, a lot of lens elements to them. That's just my theory. Um, but there's no doubt that that technology adds a lot of cost to the lens. Now, one thing some people complain about is the minimum focus distance. Now, for the 800, it's 16.41 feet away. With the 400, it's 8.2, and with the 600 it's 14.1 and we'll talk about that more in a minute and like I said cost is a big factor you're we, we already talked about the numbers there um, what's neat is you put an 800 millimeter lens on a Z9 and you shoot 4k uh, at certain frame rates you could take advantage of uh, cropping that and you could be shooting uh, basically at 1,840 millimeter equivalent angle of view without using any tele teleconverters. That's just using the built-in crop mode that's available uh, when you're in certain video modes at, at specific frame rates. But imagine 
you know, obviously, you know, at 1,840 millimeters, you're going to have that lens mounted on a tripod because uh, it's going to be very easy to have a lot of uh, shake uh, when you're really that far out. Now, they all work very well with teleconverters. Um, my indication is of everything I've read on all the reviews is, you know, with the 400 and the and the 600, they both handle the 1.4x and the 2x tele uh, in combination with their built-in tele converters. You know, very very well. Um, with the 800, my opinion is with the adding a 1.4 tele to that uh, is, you know, there's no issues with that. You put the 2x on there, you you might get a little bit of softness with it, but. Um, you know, when you're at 800 to begin with, you know, that's that's more than most people need. Now, a thing to consider if you're saying, well, which one of these lenses would I buy? Well, if you wanted it, the 800 millimeter, as close as you can get the 800 millimeter with the 400, you'd have to have the internal TC engaged. You'd, ha you'd have to put on a, another 1.4x tele, and you'd be at 784 millimeter at f5.6 so you'd still be a third of a stop faster than the f6.3 of the 800 but you're adding another 7.8 ounces of weight so now you're 27.7 ounces heavier than the 800 weighs and that's really really significant and from everything I've read if you if between having that TC engaged and adding and external TC as well. The sharpness comparison between the, the native 800 and the 400 um, with the TCs added, it's very close, but the 800 is probably a little bit sharper, which only makes sense because you're not using any TCs. Uh, not to say that the 400 with those TCs is a slouch in any manner. It's a, it's a pixel peeping type of thing. And if you put a 1.4, you engage the 1.4 tele on the 600, then you're just using the built-in tele, which is mat matched for that lens. Quality is going to be excellent. And you're at 840 millimeters at f5.6. So you're also a third of a stop um, more light gathering capability than the, the 800. But you got huge differences in price. Now, long lenses are very quiet. I mentioned before, I have minimal focus breathing for optimum video performance. Now, no other camera brand really ha has an 800 millimeter lens that compares with the Nikon. An example is the Canon RF 800 f5.6, obviously a third of a stop faster, but it costs $16,999. One thing that is kind of really nice is it can focus closer to 8.53 feet, but it weighs 6.9 pounds versus a Nikon's 5.25. So it's not actually a carry around lens that you're not going to use on a monopod or a, or a tripod. And it has uh, four and a half stops of VR um, versus five and a half when you use the 800 PF on a, on a Z9. And Sony doesn't offer an 800 millimeter lens at all. So, um, you know, I will mention Canon has an 800 f11, which is under a thousand dollars, but that's that's not a, a lens that even is anything comparable to anybody else's. So, all the lenses use electromagnetic diaphragms, and you know, so so you might say, well, why does the 800 PF cost less than the 400 or the 600? And I did kind of already talk about some of these things. I mean, the PF design reduces the amount of lens elements with minimum effect on image quality. The lens coatings are more advanced on the 400 and 600. They have faster minimum apertures for improved low light performance. And, you know, Theoretically, and I believe technically, they have slightly better bokeh 
more pleasing bokeh, although the 800 does have very creamy bokeh. It's very, very good for that lens. Nothing to complain about. And, uh, you know, when you adapt those other lenses to be close to that 800 millimeter range, they're only a third of a stop faster, which in today's day and age with technology is basically irrelevant, in my opinion. Now, the 400 and 800, excuse me, the 400 and 600 use that advanced silky smooth voice coil motors, which is magnetic system versus stepping motors, and that asks, adds a lot of cost, I'm sure. Um, let's see. So now, now the bottom line, people will say, so why would you buy an 800 millimeter lens? Well, I typically use a 500 PF lens with my Z9, you know, with the FTZ adapter, or I use my Z mount 100 to 400 zoom lens. Uh, but, you know, when you're shooting small birds, even with the 500 PF, you can only get so close without scaring them off. So you always, lots of times, you just can't cl get close enough where you have a good image size of the bird. You know, it's a lot of the background. The bird's kind of small. You end up cropping. And the more the crop, more you crop, the less you're taking advantage of the resolution of the 45.7 megapixels in the Z9. And if you go to DX mode, it's going to be less than what you'd have with a D500. So the 800 to me is going to allow me to fill the frame of a small bird at full resolution or with a very, very minimal crop. And it would be like, like what people would get when they put a 500 PF on a D500. So this will take full advantage of my camera's resolution. So that's priority number one. Another reason is many a times in the ponds, the ducks, you know, you start walking near the edge, you know, they, they swim off into the middle of the pond. They're not close enough. And once again, if you take a picture even with the 500 PF, you end up cropping. Now, if you shoot in a hide and it's close to the water, your subject will eventually move closer, not really realize that you're there. And it's not much of an issue, but we don't all have areas where we can set up a hide, and many of us are not going to want to pay to rent one. So having that extra reach is going to make a difference. Now for birds in flight, theoretically, you're going to, you're going to well, not theoretically, you're going to be able to pick up on the bird sooner, start tracking it sooner. So as it moves towards you, you're already going to be locked on that bird, and you're going to be able to be a little bit more picky about when you take that shot. So if it's, you know, one minute maybe it's there's all sky in the background, and then you're following it along the tree line, and because you've picked it up sooner, you can you could decide here's the spot where I want to take the shot. This is where the that group of trees is is nice color and nice light or whatever and it's just going to give you a little bit of a better opportunity to get a shot with a with a background that you might like now a la last consideration is if you're fortunate enough to be able to go on safari um or even if you go to yellowstone and you're shooting you know if you're shooting uh, bison or you're somewhere and you're shooting moose I mean, those animals, you know, it's, it's not a petting zoo. You know, how many times do you hear people being stupid in Yellowstone and getting hurt? But then again, they're being stupid. But with the 800, okay, you could frame that animal, be farther away, be less threatening to the animal, uh, less disturbing to it in its natural environment, and you're going to get the shot, and you're going to be in a, in a safer place where you're not worried about your safety and so you know this is where that long telephoto could end up being your best friend and it's the same thing if you were you know in safari in africa i mean you could get that perfect lion shot without having to be on top of the lion you could be a little farther away um, less disruptive to the animals and get the shot now, is this is this friend is this lens too long? Well, it can be, yes. 
but I want it for the reasons that I just previously spoke about. If I have my 500 on my camera and the larger birds are relatively close to me, my minimum focus with that lens is 9.8 feet. It's going to be 16.41 feet with the 800, which means you're going to be backing up a lot if your birds are close to the shore or close to where you're standing. You're going to be backing up a lot. So it would be good to have maybe the 1 to 400 zoom available so that you could switch to that when you have the birds that are closer. Another question people say, well, which lens should I buy? Well, that's a very personal decision. Depends on what you already own. No one that has a YouTube channel should tell you, if you don't have this particular lens, oh, you, you know, you're, you're just not serious about photography. Uh, that's that's a bunch of horse pucky. Number one, you, you you have a lot of things to consider when you're when you're buying a kit for your camera. Um, you know, some people like zooms. Some people like primes. They don't like zooms at all. Some people like to have a little bit of both. Um, it's gonna it's gonna have a lot to do with what your budget is. Um, you may you may want the very impressive 400 millimeter f 4.5 Z lens that came out. Fantastic lens. Everybody I know that has it loves it. Then again, you might be someone that wants the 100 to 400 zoom because you you like that flexibility of the zoom. So it, it, it depends on how close you need to get to your subject matter, how far away your subject matter tends to be. Everybody's needs are different. Everybody lives in different places. Everybody shoots at different things. Now, me personally, if I had no zooms at all, if I didn't have anything, say, more than my 70 to 200 f2.8, and I was going to get into bird photography, obviously that 70 to 200 is not going to work out. It's 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 okay for, you know, the, uh, the the kids' soccer game or something like that, but it isn't something I'm going to use seriously for bird photography. So what would I buy? Well, if money was no object, which is not real world for most of us, I'd still buy the the Z mount 100 to 400 f 4.5 5.6. I'd get the 400 to 8 with the built-in teleconverter. Um, I wouldn't get the 600 because the 400 and engage the engage the 1.4. Um, you know, I'm at uh, 5 560. I'm close enough. I'd get a separate 1.4 times tele in case I really wanted to add some extra reach optically, and I'd get the 800. Uh, Z mount 800 f 6.3 PF lens and that's just my opinion and that's based on if I did not have any long glass of, at all but a lot of people are are moving over from have they have f mount glass they might have the 300 PF the 500 PF um, they might have the 2 to 500 zoom um, they may not want to um, have to buy all new Z mount glass. They may want to mix it up. And, I, and I've mixed it up. I, I only got rid of a few uh, F-mount lenses. I've kept most of my F-mount lenses. And I, and I have a, a, a mix of both. Um, but that's just my opinion. And in a minute, I will, I'm going to take the, bring the lens down and show it to you closer and talk about it a little bit. So here we are with the 800 PF mounted on a Z9 and uh, you got a huge lens hood that has a locking feature. Um, I'll show you that if I can in a minute. But you basically have your, in this side view, you have your function buttons. You have numerous ones that go all the way around but they they are not individually programmable. So you program, all these buttons will do the same thing whatever you uh, program it to. Then you have your control ring, which has a different texture. It's very easy to distinguish, and you use that. I'll, you know, I probably use that for on my other lenses for exposure compensation. 
I rotate it and, and uh, adjust my exposure compensation through this control ring. And then you have your, your focusing ring. And you have um, areas where you can put a, a strap on the lens. You have your memory set button so that you can hold that in. And um, at the touch of a button, you, know, you program one of, your, one of your function buttons to uh, go to whatever that memory set button was programmed to distance-wise. And it'll go focus at that point when you hit the appropriate function button. Now, you also have, if I go to the top here, you have removable filter holder, 46 millimeters. It has a label on it that says front with an arrow, so you put it back in the right way. I'll rotate this around. And you have a cap that comes off this knob that you use to tighten the tripod foot collar attachment. And you pop off the cap, and that's where you can put a Kensington lock. And you just have, you know, auto or manual. And then you have a button to limit your focus um, on the camera, which is from... Uh, 10 meters, either either full range or 10 meters to infinity. And that's about it. I mean, it's, it's very well balanced. Um, you know, it doesn't feel that heavy when you're holding it. And, you know, I, I like to leave the foot down. I, I, I put the foot in the palm of my hand. I mean, basically, I could, I could reach one of these function buttons easily move my fingers back a little bit, I can adjust the control ring, slide my hand back a little more, I can adjust the, the manual focus, and, and that's how I like to do it. Some people like to rotate the foot so it's up at the top and out of the way, and they, they may put their hand more towards the, the end of the lens, and obviously if you have it on a, on a tripod, lots of times people put their hand down to help steady it on the tripod. Um, tripod foot is very strong, uh, well made, but unfortunately, as is typical, all, all these camera manufacturers, lens manufacturers, uh, they're not using Arca Swiss compatible feet, so you're going to have to either buy a different foot for it or an adapter plate to put on it. And the bottom, you know, I had some adapter plates that I thought I could use, but unfortunately, it has two threaded inserts, you know, for the different uh, thread diameters that you would find on different style tripods. So they're not both the same size or I could take one of my existing plates and screw it into this because I got two different size uh, threads. So I'll have to spend more money if I want to put a foot on this or, or, or an adapter plate. And you know obviously it's it, metal and and the high-end plastics that that Nikon likes to use to keep the, the lens weight down some people get all excited that it has a gold ring at the end of it I mean I I don't get all hung up on that kind of stuff um, so I'll follow up um, with this more um, when I get out there and get some pictures I'll, I'll you know show you some results of using it and uh, that's how we'll conclude this uh, this video. So as, they, as I say, enjoy life, capture some of it, and we'll continue on with some sample images. See you in a little bit. Well, I caught myself with something I didn't talk about, not a big deal. Another function button here. Now, they're not all at the front or uh, of the lens. You have one function button here above your where you set your auto manual in your uh, your limit switch for your range of focus so just wanted to throw that in and because I forgot about it we start off with a quick video of a wood stork this is at uh, 4k 120 10-bit handheld which you could tell it's a little shaky 
I didn't have, um, did not have at the time an Arca Swiss plate to mount on the foot, so I couldn't put it on my monopod. So it is what it is, so I apologize. Then the first photo we're going to talk about here is at ISO 16,000 early in the morning, one four hundredth of a second, F6.3, no crop. This one's at ISO 14,400, no crop as well. Now we see a, a short video of this great blue heron. It's like looking for food, but he never really found it in this instance. Like I said, it's it's very hard to hand hold a uh, lens of this length. I mean, not that you can't do it, but I'm still getting comfortable with it. I'd get better over time, but normally I would have it on uh, my monopod, um, and I will in the future. And this is pretty early in the morning as well. I mean, my mornings start, you know, I'm there at 6.30 a.m. before the sun comes up. And, you know, this is probably taken within an hour of that. And then this is, of course, the, uh, a great egret. I saw 10,000. Female merganser at ISO 4500. Now it was cropped. This is a slight crop on this bird. This one has no crop at all. Great egrets. And here's a uh, male merganser. Just taken off in flight. And you can see the detail. I mean, the, the sharpness of this lens is incredible. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Here's a, a short video clip of some female mergansers. And there is a part coming up where they get a little bit uh, feisty with each other. I guess that's the term I'll use. You'll see that coming up. Oh, here we go. We don't always get along nice and play in the water well together. Yeah, when these uh, females kind of came in looking for food, getting a little active, um, there was a black crown night here, and it, uh, you'll see some pictures of it in a bit that got a little frustrated and said, you know, I'm not putting up with you little guys and decided to take off and fly and leave the area. And these are some very, very sharp pictures of the male mergansers. They're not. They're not cropped. There's no teleconverter on there. It's just straight 800. Red winged blackbird photos. I really like how that came out. The detail in the claws, the bokeh. People who say the bokeh isn't that great, I would argue with them. I'll tell you that. I mean, you know, if you have a background that's close, sure, it's not going to dissolve it as well as, you know, um, an F4 lens or, or the 400 28, but it's respectable. But if you have your background in the distance and you basically have water or you have uh, colors behind it, 
they, they look really, really, really good. This is a lesser scalp. And that one was in DX mode there. And then we skipped to a quick video. Unfortunately, I had some dust on my lens that I didn't notice at the time. Uh, some uh, white pelicans coming in for a landing. They're always fun to watch. It's always fun to see them hit the brakes when they land. This next still is of a white pelican, one one thousandth of a second, wide open, f6.3, ISO 640, just to give you an idea. Followed by a great egret. This is in DX mode. Sharp as can be. And uh, the this is a no crop image, which most of them are no crop. This is no crop, and I was a little bit too close. I cut off a little more of the bird than I wanted to with the tail area, but you could just see it's mainly to show you the detail. These mergansers, uh, you know, just really, really good. That was in, they were in DX mode. Same with this shot. This is in DX mode as well. This was great. It was having a salad to go with the fish. Now, these are some interesting clips of my dog. This is using the 1.4 Tele. And in here, I cropped it considerably. And you can just see the detail. You can see what I, what I call the schmutz around the eye. And absolutely perfect detail in these images, and the bulk is great in the background. Now, this one I took mainly to show you the specular highlights. That is a complaint that PF lenses don't render or too susceptible to specular highlights, don't render them very well, and I tend to agree with that. It's not going to be as good as a $10,000 or $15,000 lens. And these pictures of the black crown night heron are great. I like the one with the fish in the mouth. And we'll finish up with some commentary. Okay, folks, one more bit of important commentary before we end this uh, video is when you go back and you look at the pictures I took of my best friend Patches, my, my dog, and I shot with the 1.4 Tele, so I'm at 1120 millimeters. And obviously that's why the dog, you don't see the whole dog in the picture. I was 50, 60 feet away, and I couldn't get far enough back uh, to fit the dog entirely in the frame. But that wasn't the point of that exercise. But why I'm bringing that up is I left the Tele on. I tried to get a picture of a goose. A couple geese that were eating grass about 100 to 150 feet away uh, on my property. And no matter what I did, I had a 25th, 200, uh, 2, 2500th of a second shutter speed. I was shooting at F9 to F16. I was braced against the fence. I used uh, large area wide autofocus, animal tracking. Um, tried single point autofocus. No matter what I did, those images were crap. They were the, the they were they were blurry. They weren't sharp, and I could tell the autofocus was struggling, and I couldn't figure out why. I didn't really get the answer to that question, or figure out what it was until the next day, when I thought, "Hey, I'm going to try taking a video with the 800 using the DX crop mode, so I get that 2.3 times crop." so that I could try to get an eagle's nest that was far away from the boardwalk at the nature center. Now when I tried to shoot the video, there was, that video was totally useless. 
And when I finally realized what it was, it was heat distortion. The image was shaky. It was like looking through a mirror. You, you could just see the heat waves. You could just see the eagles out of focus. The autofocus system could not do anything about it. The heat distortion was just horrible. And then that explained why I had a problem with the stills the day before trying to get the geese. Because the farther away your subject is from your film plane or your sensor, the worse the effect is of heat distortion. And heat distortion is caused when you have a severe temperature change between either the ground in the air or water in the air, or it could be a road surface in the air, or the hood of your car in the wintertime in the air. And so lights ref refracted through cold air and hot air differently. And because of that, you get uh, heat waves that, in the worst case scenario, are visible. And you can see them when you're looking through the viewfinder. But there are times when you have it and you can't really tell. And that was the situation when I was shooting the geese. It was not obvious to me that it was heat distortion. Now, it isn't something that only happens in the summertime. If you go to, if you went to Yellowstone in the wintertime and you saw a bison and you pull your car over and you get out of the car and you decide to lean across the hood and use the hood as support and put your camera lens there and take a picture of it, it's going to come out horrible because you got all that heat coming off the engine. Your hood is hot. The air is, is freezing cold, below freezing. You're going to have heat distortion. There's no way that picture is going to come out sharp. And you might not, it just may not kick in why that's happening. I've seen examples of heat distortion where you have a city that's, say, surrounded by water, has water on one side of it or what have you. And so you got a view of the ocean in the foreground. You see the skyscrapers in the background. And the skyscrapers and, and, and everything is all wavy like a noodle. Nothing is sharp. It looks absolutely horrible. That's heat distortion. And while some people will tell you, well, it's usually just at ground level, it can go a lot. Obviously, a skyscraper is a lot higher than ground level, so that, that's not entirely true. Uh, when you look at example photos of it, it can be a skyscraper. It could be, you know, um, things that are very, very high. You know, in the case of mine, the eagles were, were high up off the water, high up off the ground. You know, they're in the, top, the, the tallest tree tallest pine tree there was so um, so much for that theory that you only you're only going to have it in your ground level and the thing is that distance makes the heat distortion worse so when the further away the subject is the more heat distortion is going to be present you've got more light you got more air path between your um, you know your film plane or your or your plane of your um, sensor and your subject and so the longer the lens the farther away your subject is the worse it's going to get and you can't avoid it and it has nothing to do with an 800 pf being sixty five hundred dollars and a you know 600 f4 being 15 ish or whatever it has nothing to do with price it has nothing to do with the amount of coatings you have on your lens it has everything to do with the effects of long lenses and 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 uh, being more susceptible than, uh, to the heat distortion than if you're shooting a subject that's closer. When I when I failed at getting the, the geese at 150 feet away, when I turned around in the other direction and I shot at some geese 75 feet away, they came out tack sharp. So that was the answer to my problem. It just wasn't obvious to me on that day that I was taking the stills. You can't avoid this, so, you know, uh, you just have to be aware of it. And I just wanted to share that with everybody. So I hope you enjoyed, it, uh, enjoyed these videos. Please give me a thumbs up. Please leave some comments. Uh, share with your friends. And if you're not a subscriber, be nice enough to subscribe. I would appreciate it. I put a lot of effort into the, this, uh, these videos and, and stills and... Uh, the only way I, I uh, sense 
uh, get my satisfaction is to get wonderful commentary that I typically get from those of you that watch my channel and and see some subscribers uh, uh, show up that I haven't had before and uh, that's what keeps me going and wanting to keep on doing this so thank you very much in advance God bless until next time enjoy life capture some of it get out there and get some great pictures